Anarchy, Mass Movement and Revolution. My name is Sean, I'm a Cat Fire member from East London. This is John Rees who's going to be doing the meeting. He's one of the founders of the Stop the War Coalition and one of the organisers of the People's Assembly. The format of the meeting is going to be relatively the same as the others. Um, John will speak first and then please, please, you know, lots of contribution questions and then rounding up at the end. So John's going to kick off. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, what I want to do um, today is to try and uh, map out um, both uh, historically in our, in our recent past and, uh, if you like, um, sociologically, what is happening between the broadest forms of mobilisation in mass movements, um, the way in which those become uh, represented or fail to become represented in mainstream electoral uh, politics, and a kind of strategy for the left that emerges from that description of the landscape in which we're operating. So uh, I want to start um, with the kind of uh, beginning, I think, of where the kind of modern era of mass movements uh, uh, originated, which is really with the um, anti-capitalist uh, movement, in particular the demonstration in uh, Seattle in 1999. Uh, those uh, mobilizations went on for a period of time, fed into um, when the attack on the Twin Towers took place and the uh, American plans to invade Afghanistan and Iraq into the, into the anti-war movement and have been characteristic of a, a lot of the other social movements um, that have taken place in that time period as well. So we're looking at a period which begins, as I say, in 1999 and runs up in terms of British politics uh, up, until, up until last year when I think something different um, began uh, began to happen. So that period, um, the initial period, is where um, after a, a long period, a long time really, um, where there hadn't been a sort of characteristic of mass mobilisation on the street, that whole period is, is dominated, sometimes more intensively um, than at others, but is dominated um, by those kind of mo those kind of mobilisations. There's a certain kind of political analysis that went with that. Uh, I mean, a, a, I don't mean a sort of narrow analysis in terms of what the left wrote. I mean the kind of consciousness that perhaps um, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who were participants in that movement or uh, who were informed by the experience of that mass movement drew. I would say they were, one, um, that there was a democratic deficit in the society, that the kind of things that were being said and being argued for by the anti-capitalist movement and the anti-war movement found um, very little significant echo within mainstream politics. I mean, this was particularly the case, of course, after um, the British government um, took us into the um, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. That was the moment um, where the Labour Party lost uh, four million uh, voters at the polls and has never uh, to this day uh, managed to recoup, uh, recoup that, uh, that loss. There was a, a widespread uh, disaffection with the entire political elite. If you look at the British Social Attitude Survey, which is the government's own a survey of public opinion in this country, and it goes through um, public faith in a number of institutions. And in nearly all the mainstream institutions, the courts, the press, but particularly uh, politicians, all the graphs just go like that after the uh, Iraq, Iraq war to the extent that uh, politicians have a, a lower social standing um, than estate agents at the, at the moment, which is obviously um, pretty much near the bottom of the pile. Um, so uh, there's this kind of sense that there's a hemorrhage uh, between what most people are thinking and what the political elite are thinking. We can go through all the scandals and the, the corruption and the, uh, the MP expenses. You know, time and time again, this has been reinforced in the public's mind over that period. It's summed up in the, the kind of Occupy movements, uh, another expression of that same, of that same experience, um, the idea that, they, that, that we are the 99% and they are the 1%, which is an exaggeration in our favour, but nevertheless gives you some uh, sense of how people were looking at the looking at the society, and it is of course exclusively um, or almost exclusively an extra parliamentary radicalism. It finds in Britain almost no echo 
inside the inside the the, par the parliamentary uh, machine or the electoral or electoral politics uh, generally. I mean, not absolutely nothing. George Galloway was elected. Karen Lu Caroline Lucas uh, was was elected. The work councillors in this part of the world and others elected. Some NHS campaigners elected in some parts. But in general. The entirety of the electoral system, especially in Britain because of the nature of the first past the post system, in part remained more or less completely immune to something like uh, 15 years of continuous mobilisation on the streets. Some people refer to this as apathy um, because of the declining turnout at the, the elections, the declining faith in the mainstream, in the mainstream parties. That was never true. Uh, when the people who didn't uh, vote in not this last election, but in the 2010 election, were asked why they didn't vote. Um, one partic this uh, particularly interesting poll, um, the majority of people said that they deliberately didn't vote. It, they deliberately didn't vote because they couldn't place any faith, couldn't find any point of recognition between their politics and the politics being expressed uh, by the elite. It wasn't even that they weren't active on other questions. If you look at the, the figures for the number of people who participate in demonstrations, it's rocketed in the last decade. The number of people who signed political petitions, rocketed in the last decade. If you ask people, as one survey did, how do you self-define yourself? How would you define yourself politically? 7.5 million people define themselves as either left or far left. In this, uh, in this country. So whatever else might be said about this mood and the nature of this, it wasn't an apolitical, it wasn't an apolitical mood, it wasn't a disengaged political mood, it was just disengaged with establishment and electoral politics. Now I would say um, in Britain um, that began to change and it began to change quite sharply last year and the, the most obvious place uh, to, to uh, point to the beginning of this is the referendum campaign uh, in Scotland. At that point, the characteristics which up to then we would have identified as being part of social movement politics flooded in uh, to the Yes referendum campaign. The popular mobilisation, the popular enthusiasm, the way in which that campaign, driven by the left, driven by the grassroots, got out into sections of working class Scottish society in the way that no establishment or electoral politics had done in perhaps a decade or a decade and a half produced that huge um, yes vote. Even more significant of course for the long run it detached practically the entirety of Labour's voting base from the Labour Party and transferred it in the last general election uh, to, uh, the SN, to the SNP. You can say that something in, on a, a much lower key, uh, but something similar could be noticed in Britain in the in the Green Surge, in the uh, rise in the membership of the Green Party in the run-up uh, to the general election. I would argue that that didn't really sustain itself through the general election. I think the nature of the Greens' uh, general election campaign uh, didn't enhance the Green Surge, didn't really deliver uh, for the Green Surge, and was actually a slightly disappointing experience. Uh, for them politically, but it marks the same thing. It marks a re-engagement of what had previously been an extra parliamentary mood, an extra parliamentary movement with some kind of, uh, of, electoral, of electoral politics. And I would say that you can see something of the same kind of thing. Again, these are different registers, different levels of intensity, different levels of public engagement. But I think the reaction um, to uh, Jeremy Corbyn's decision to stand uh, for leader of the Labour Party has had something of, of, a similar, of a similar effect because it's within one party, because it's not a social movement, it's more limited, but you can see a kind of genuine enthusiasm, uh, a kind of um, slightly grassroots driven uh, push to get him on to the uh, to get him on to the ballot paper and uh, and so on which people I think rightly identify as being something which is helping to uh, build the anti-austerity movement which is reinforcing the message of the anti-austerity movement which is feeding in that debate inside inside politics I mean let's face it um, until Jeremy Corbyn declared his candidacy the the, the whole Labour leadership campaign was a kind of um, Mount Rushmore of mediocrity. Um, there was absolutely, you know, disastrous kind of uh, series of pronouncements coming out of the of all of the, the the Labour leadership campaigns. Um, and Jeremy declaring for that 
um, totally altered that debate. And I would say the first television debate was something like the debate uh, where Nicola Sturgeon um, wiped the floor um, with all the other candidates in the general election. Simply the fact that Corbyn was there changed the whole nature of the debate to being one that was for or against. Not various, uh, not various shades of how much do you hate immigrants, not various shades of how much austerity would you like, not various shades of how neoconservative do you think our foreign policy would be, but a debate between austerity and not austerity, between being in favour of immigration and against immigration. Totally changed the terms of those debates. And very interestingly, the BBC told Jeremy Corbyn when he went on that debate um, that this is going to be, it was in Nuneaton, it was composed, if you remember, of people who were um, not necessarily long-term Labour voters, who voted Conservative or UKIP at the last election. The BBC told him, this is going to be a very hard debate for you, uh, the audience is going to be hostile to you, particularly on the question of immigration. Actually, on the night, if any of you watched it, it was completely the opposite. It was like the, the audience were kind of lobbing up these balls for Jeremy to just whack back across the, the, the net. They were actually engaged with him in a way they weren't engaged with Liz Kendall, <laughs> imagine, uh, with Liz Kendall, <laughs> um, or any of the other uh, contenders who temporarily are on their names. Um, so this is a this is a change in the in the in the in the political situation. It doesn't mean that the the previous period of mobilisation has gone away. Fairly obviously, um, the the people's assembly, not just on the demonstration. I think it's important to say this. The demonstration obviously was the the biggest manifestation, the biggest uh, organised demonstration that we we've, we've called so far on the question. Uh, of austerity from the People's Assembly. But the whole run-up to that, the people's question times that we had in different localities, the rallies that we had in, people's, uh, in the localities, even the demonstration last year, which was 50,000 people, that level of social mobilization, social movement mobilization is going on, but it's now interacting with electoral and establishment politics in a way that it didn't do in the, in the previous period. Now, that's come as a surprise uh, to, lots of, to lots of people. You can see the debate going around on the left, that this is a this is a shock. We've become used to a kind of uh, popular sentiment that there's kind of, you know, the whole of electoral politics is to be written off. That the whole of the Labour Party it's the same uh, as the Tory Party. That uh, they're all the same in the popular uh, in, in in the popular uh, terminology. And I think it's an important point now um, that 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 those extreme formulations of what was going on in electoral politics. Were, all, were always that. They were always exaggerations. They were always um, one-sided statements of what was what was going on, particularly uh, in regard of the Labour Party. And it's worth just um, thinking through properly um, what the Labour Party represents and why this is happening and what the attitude um, of the left should be, particularly um, that section of the left who, like me, um, has never been a member of the Labour Party and doesn't uh, believe that you can get a socialist transformation of society by working through the Labour Party or indeed uh, by, parliamentary, by parliamentary politics. But to arrive at a, a serious and sensible um, attitude towards that, political attitude towards that, you have to have the nature of the thing correctly in your mind. And it simply won't do to say that the Labour Party is the same as the Tory party. That is simply not true. It may be true at the level, although this is also a slight exaggeration, but not much, it may be true at the level of policy that you can't distinguish between the neoconservative foreign policy of the Tory party and the neoconservative uh, pol foreign policy of the Labour Party, particularly under Blair. It's hard to imagine a Tory party that will kind of get to the right of Tony Blair on the question of foreign policy. That's a space that's pretty conclusively been closed down. It's also uh, true to say that there's not much difference, uh, and particularly in the case of the current leadership contenders, um, between pol in policy terms, between the austerity that was on offer uh, from the Tories and the austerity that was on offer uh, from uh, the Labour Party leadership. But that isn't the same as saying that they are the same thing. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, Marcus Aurelius's old question, which is ask first of a thing, what is it in itself? And the Labour Party as a thing is not the same as the Tory party as a thing. The Tory party is the open and declared party of big business in this country. There is no contradiction, no qualification necessary to that definition. That's what it is, that's what it's always been. Um, it's uh, undisguised about that, uh, about that fact. 
labor is still based on and rooted in the working class. The overwhelming majority of working class people vote labor. That's sim simply, uh, simply a fact. The overwhelming money for labor election campaigns comes not from the rich and corporations. It comes 70% of it from the trade unions, still, at the last election, still in this, uh, in this country. And while we can make a whole number of perfectly valid points about the way in which the Labour leadership has become detached from its membership, the way in which the party has become more undemocratic, the way in which the leadership is seeking to move it away from dependence on the trade unions. Hey, uh, Andy Burnham um, sent round a circular to the trade union saying, um, I don't want any trade union money from my, from my election uh, campaign. True at the, at, the, at, the top of the, uh, at the top of the party, at the leadership level, not true not true about the membership of, of, uh, of the Labour Party. These are overwhelmingly working class activists rooted in the trade unions with the support of many, many trade unionists. It's simply impossible to think that the nine million votes that Labour got at the last election, not its best electoral performance, but nine million votes overwhelmingly came from working class areas. And if you look at the way in which the electoral map in this country looks now, that's what it looks like. Uh, you know, inside the North Circular in London is like its own mini Scotland. It's pretty much all red. Um, in Birmingham, only Sutton Coalfield, which those of you who've lived in Birmingham, like me, will know it's not really Birmingham, um, is uh, blue. The rest of Birmingham is red. You can go through it. Liverpool, Manchester, Leicester, Sheffield, same thing. So um, we're not talking about for all the ways in which neoliberalism has eaten into the policy stance and the leadership of the Labour Party, it's not true that this is a party which is like the Tory party. It's not. It's a contradictory class formation. Lenin had a phrase for it. He said, the Labour Party is what he called a bourgeois workers' party. In other words, it is composed of working class people, gets its support from working class people, but pursues policies which are compatible or identical to those of the bourgeoisie. Now, this is an important factor that we're dealing with an amalgam, an alloy. And so those people who say it's simply dead, or it's no longer any different from the Tory party are wrong, those people who say it's the representative of working class opinion, it's reclaimable for socialism, those people are also wrong. It's a tricky thing because it's an amalgam of both working class support and uh, adherence to the fundamental tenets of the way in which capitalism, capitalism works. And therefore, it's necessary to think how it's possible to relate to the best aspirations of the trade unionists and activists who formed the Labour Party, who often whose ideas about the way society should be are identical to or very similar to socialists outside the Labour Party, how we relate to those people without at the same time swallowing the argument that there's some long-term process which can transform it into a genuine socialist, uh, genuine socialist organisation. I think one of the things to understand here is that this kind of consciousness is rooted quite deeply in working class people's experience under capitalism. It's a fundamental element of working class experience that you both have to put up with the way in which capitalism works and at the same time you seek to resist it. You have to work for wages because that's the only way that most of us are going to put a roof over our head or food in our mouths, but you don't like the wages system and you'd certainly like higher wages than you've got. You don't want to have to go and find a job by, from some employer, but that's the way the system works, and you'd certainly like a better job on better conditions. In other words, the idea that we're within the system but want to change it for the better is something which is fundamentally rooted not just in the political philosophy of reformist parties, but in the fundamental life experience of working people, which is why it manifests itself in this particular uh, form of political organisation. Not only this form of political organisation, of course, and that's not the only experience, that day-to-day -day experience of living within capitalism, is not the only experience that working class people have. They also have the experience, usually for limited but intense periods of time, of going on strike, or being part of a rent strike, or being part of a mass movement, or being part of a riot, or being part of some form of um, resistance to the system that breaks beyond the limits that the electoralism would like to confine you to. So there is both an experience which produces a kind of predisposition um, towards the way in which the Labour Party works, and also, running counter to it, 
running alongside it, sometimes running in opposition to it, other forms of political experience, other forms of political radicalism, which can point to a different kind of political organisation. So there's a battle with inside the working class about whether working class aspirations and working class struggles are going to be represented by this particular form of political organisation or some other form of political organisation. And this is a very important point because there's a huge difference, there's a huge question about how people's aspirations and struggles are politically represented. The fact that you go on strike, or the fact that you are part of a huge demonstration, or the fact that you're part of a rent strike, or a struggle over housing, or whatever it might be, doesn't tell you how, on a more permanent basis, those kind of aspirations will be, if you like, crystallised out into political organisation. There's the experience of struggle, and, there's, and then there is, connected to it, but not the same as it, a battle to construct permanent political organisation based on that struggle. One line of causation, one line of uh, kind of determination that can run out from those struggles is the Labour Party line. Another kind of line of causation that can run out from that is the idea that you form an organisation like Tankfaris or like others on the, or the Communist Party was in the 30s, a revolutionary organisation, which although it's a minority within the working class, seeks to influence the class by cooperating in broader movements with other political with other political forces. This has been our theory um, when we were involved in constructing um, the Stop the War Coalition. It's really the, the kind of sensibility that we've got when we're working with inside the PA. And I guess this is the final point I want to make about this. These movements, if you come into them first time, say the demonstration as it was for I think tens of thousands of people last Saturday, say that's your first demonstration or one of the first demonstrations you've been on. Probably the way, you know, if, if, you, if you're thinking about it at all, uh, probably you think that those kind of things are kind of more or less spontaneous. That people are angry about it, they react to the, uh, the election, that they go out on the streets and that that's why that happens. Somebody calls a demonstration, people react because they're angry, they arrive as a kind of multitude of individuals and that's how that demonstration took place. Now, there's an element of truth in that. Certainly people were angry about the, uh, the outcome of the election. Certainly austerity is eating into their lives. Certainly they had the opportunity to react politically and many of them took it. But to be honest, that's only part of the story and maybe not even the most important part of the story. The truth is that any opposition like this, any unity like that, doesn't just happen. It has to be constructed. It has to be politically constructed. Because what the working class in particular looks like and what the society in general looks like is not just a mass of atomized individuals. As if, you know, it's like a kind of political version of free market theory that we're all like atomized consumers and the prices move according to which goods we purchase and get <coughs> It's not like that. People are born into families that have poli particular political traditions. Mine was a labor, mine was a labor family. Or they're part of a particular church or mosque or they're part of a trade union organisation, or they're part of some kind of civic group, or they're part of a particular workplace, and all these things are already existing social constructions. And when, or they're part of political parties. And when you're trying to build a movement, you have to look at the political landscape and understand that those institutions already exist. When we started constructing the, the People's Assembly, we knew that, of course, that there are still 6.5 million workers in trade unions in this country, that no serious movement is going to get built without some degree of active cooperation in the trade union movement. We knew that as revolutionary socialists, you can't just think that your particular brand of socialism is going to be enough to build a mass movement. No, you have to look at what the Labour left are doing, you have to seek to engage the Green Party, then you have to think about what church organizations or NGOs, what War on Want has been a very important part of building the People's Assembly is doing. You have to construct from the already existing loyalties, the already existing structures in society, a broad enough campaign that can mobilize on a big enough scale. And it's that skeleton, that skeleton of existing uh, affiliations and organizations which enables people who perhaps have none of those to join in. The unaffiliated people, the people who haven't yet been or aren't, and aren't many of them, somebody somewhere has always got some kind of connection, but even if you imagine such a person, their ability to participate 
is built around the skeleton you construct out of the existing organizations. Now this is the way in which, this is a particular way in which you can relate to other developments in the labor movement. So take Jeremy, I mean, Jeremy will be here soon to speak for himself. Uh, of course, I'm in favor of Jeremy Corbyn having the biggest possible vote um, for uh, leader of the Labour Party, because if an openly anti-war, anti-austerity candidate gets a huge vote, that will lift not only the Labour Party left, it will lift the entire left and the trade union movement and the entire anti-austerity movement. Absolutely, uh, absolutely no question. But at the same time, the way in which that campaign is being organized and fought will have more than one political outcome. Of course, the people in the Labour left, John Lansman, who spoke here last year, they're working very hard to, to recreate a Labour left which has virtually ceased to exist inside the Labour Party with the overall aim of keeping as many people as they possibly can inside the Labour Party for the long-term goal of transforming the Labour Party. Now, I don't agree that that's a, a, a desirable or possible. It's desirable, but it's not possible. And because it's not possible, it's not desirable, I guess is the way, uh, the way I would look at it. I want something else out of the end of that campaign. I want the greater mobilization of the anti-austerity movement, and even if Jeremy loses, I want as many people who are mobilized by his campaign to flood back in to the anti-austerity movement and to reinforce it and to reinvigorate it through that. And that's a difference of long-term perspective, even though we have a unity of immediate aim. And it's that kind of strategic and tactical decision which can make a revolutionary left more relevant, more capable of articulating a view, of engaging in a conversation with people who aren't yet in agreement with it, but who are willing to participate with us in the broader movement against austerity, will look on us as reasonable people to which to enter in a dialogue, the more we go out of our way to engage with them on those terms. This will not work. This will not work if you start off from the point of view that there's just a desert out there. Social democracy's dead. Social democracy has been hollowed out, the unions are finished, I mean partly the arguments that some were put in the last session that there's just a kind of atomized precariat. It's not an atom, it's that, that's not, not an accurate picture of what is happening inside the working, uh, working, cla working class movement. It's a, it's, a partial, uh, it's a partial apprehension of some aspects of, of what is happening, but it's a very far from an accurate picture. You know, when you look at, at you know, a quarter of a million people, that's not the mass precariat. That's something else happening uh, inside, inside the society. So that view, the kind of horizontalist view as it emerged out of some of the movements, won't work because essentially it's an apolitical view. It fails to engage with the institutions that actually still exist within inside the society. It fails to engage with the politics of how a broad movement could be constructed. It therefore fails to mobilize the largest possible numbers against the common enemy. But while we're doing that to engage about a debate, about how a socialist transformation of society is ultimately possible. Uh, thank you to John for that. It's your time now, so uh, I've, I've got one. For you, Kip. Now, a lot of the working class people, were they guilty of false consciousness or else, else to explain that phenomenon? Thank you. And the woman at the back, please. Um, I mentioned in the trade union talk upstairs that I do feel myself to be one of the unaffiliated people. And I wouldn't say they're as rare as you make out. Myself and most of my friends and sort of acquaintances, I would never come, in, certainly not in, in person, into contact with the sort of skeleton structures that you're talking about. Um, I work for a startup which is 20 people, so again, no sort of community there or family life or church or anything like that. Um, the way that I came into contact with the People's Assembly was via Facebook, um, and I am sort of almost angry that I had, didn't come into Counterfire um, sooner than I have today. Um, so I was wondering, what, do you, what role do you think the internet might play in the sort of future um, of socialists? And Sort of, as well as political parties, because the I joined up to Labour just before the election, and their sort of presence online was abysmal, as well as the sort of contact that I received from them, and continually texts and sort of paper is just a bit outdated. And the guy just behind you. Yeah. 
hello. Uh, I just wanted to ask John, I mean, long term, how does he see a kind of movement for social revolution actually coming about and developing? And just to, to your left. <coughs> How do you how do you sustain a movement? Because you saw the stop, stop the war coalition come out with a big demonstration, but the demonstration sort of seems to me to get smaller and smaller as time went on, and yet the government went to war, and the Tory government this time has said, however many people get out on the streets, the um, you know will be ignored through the anti-austerity. They'll just ignore us and just carry on. But how do we actually sustain that and build this white um, I'm just going to invite this, this man with the red t-shirt and then maybe John wants to come back on some of those questions and contributions as well. Uh, I understand that definitely there is certain difference. I understand that there is anyway certain difference between the uh, Conservative Party and, and Labour, Labour Party. But however, if we look at the reality, we see that through after, you know, all social de democratic parties, and, and if you see <coughs> Labour Party is a, is a social democratic party, they are, they are deserted reforms. And as far as Labour Party is concerned, I don't, I don't think that Labour Party is still is believing Persian reformism and it has been completely de deserted uh, reform and it was it was manifestly showed when the Tony Blair uh, came to power and in order to guarantee the capitalism and uh, and the uh, 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 capitalist uh, uh, class uh, removed uh, removed article 4 from Labour Party constitution. That's one point. And second, when we are talking about the mass movement, mass movement is based on on certain demands. For instance, now austerity uh, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, is, uh, 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 is an slogan that within it austerity means that. Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, fighting against unemployment uh, and uh, uh, if you and can start uh, summing up thank you. yes okay and uh, so my point is that uh, in a, in a not not share social movement has to be based on certain crucial de demands and initially that demand will be very broad but gradually gradually those de de demand as progressing, it will it will uh, it will mobilize uh, movement towards uh, towards socialist movement. Um, yeah, um, I think the SNP. Uh, I don't think the SNP is a a, a class-based party like the Labour Party is. I think what happened is that because. Um, First of all, it, it couldn't have happened um, without the referendum campaign. That's absolutely that's absolutely certain. Uh, I think the the watershed moment about the referendum campaign was, in part, the grassroots mobilisation uh, in favour of yes, and secondly, the fact that Labour absolutely disastrously um, fought the no campaign on a joint platform with the Tories. There's lots of things that Labour Party voters and supporters will stand, but joint campaigning with the Tories is not one of them. And by the way, which rather underlines my point about the different nature of the, of the parties and the way in which they're differently uh, constructed. Because that was a moment where suddenly you could see the complete shearing off of the Labour Party leadership, which stood on, on the same platforms as the Tories, and the Labour Party base, which in its vast majority in Scotland just wasn't having wasn't having that. That's been reinforced by the fact that the SNP's policy programme um, is to the left of Labour. No to Trident, you know, etc. etc. No to austerity no to austerity. My personal view is this that all the SNP's best days are going to be before independence. 
Once they're independent, they are in charge of a small capitalist state on the northwest corner of Europe, and they're going to have to run it like every other um, party did. And if you look at the domestic records of the SNP, of course, it's not as good as the policy uh, as the policy pronouncements. Um, that's not a defence of the Labour Party in Scotland. They made an absolutely catastrophic series of uh, mistakes, um, including, uh, and this is scarcely believable, even after the general election, to elect Jim Murphy as their leader was, well, it's the equivalent of just taking the gun to your head and pulling the, uh, pulling the trigger, which is, of course, uh, what, what they've done. So I think the SNP is a left-leaning nationalist party, which mostly because of Labour's mistakes, managed to take Labour's working class base away from it in the referendum and in the, uh, and in the election. I don't think that will last in, necessarily last. I don't mean that Labour will reconstruct itself, but I think in an independent Scotland, there will be a reappearance of a right wing of a, of a social democratic debate. In the meantime, of course, it means that politics in Scotland are completely different than politics in England, because the whole political spectrum was just lurched to the left. The debate is between a kind of right of centre Labour Party and a left of centre um, SNP, which, you know, as we all know, south of the border, ain't the way it's happening down here at the at the moment. I think the UKIP, I think the UKIP vote is an interesting vote, and it's it's an amalgam vote. Now, it's an amalgam, firstly, of right wing disaffected racist Tories. That's one section of the of the vote, no question, and the majority of the vote, by the way. Not the, not the minority, the majority of the vote. A minority of the vote is disaffected um, Labour uh, supporters. And I think Jeremy quite right about this. I think those people cannot be won back on the basis of current Labour Party policy. Just on the question of immigration, it seems to be an absolutely blinding no-brainer to me that you cannot answer a party which says, we hate immigrants, uh, with a reply which says, and we half hate them as well. That really isn't going to be an argument. You've got to stand up to that argument and you've got to win those people back. And I think it was a very interesting moment when Max, uh, in, during the election campaign, issued the I am an immigrant underground poster and there was the crisis with the uh, people drowning in the Mediterranean. There was suddenly a moment there where you could feel the popular mood shifting away from anti-immigration and into sympathy and understanding about the immigration question. If the Labour Party took that up centrally and took the Tories on it, they wouldn't have lost the votes to UKIP that they did in my, in my never mind about the whole rest of it, because the, the working class vote um, for, uh, for uh, Labour, well, it's very interesting in that debate, there was a firefighter who stood up in that debate on television and said, I was a Labour voter. I voted, I didn't vote Labour at the last election because I was disappointed in them. I couldn't conceivably vote Tory. In other words, he's a class conscious worker. I'm never going to vote for the Tories. But I did vote for UKIP because he thought that was a way of giving the establishment a kick in the ass. Now, if Labour were doing its business, it'd be kicking the ass of the establishment every single day and he wouldn't be losing those, uh, those, uh, those voters. Um, I'm not saying there, aren't, there are, of course, lots of people who are in the situation that you describe who aren't connected to those things, but you, you, are, you are seeing what happened in, in the way that you came towards the movement. I'm kind of describing the way in which we constructed a movement that could make that demonstration, make that demonstration happen. And of course, as I said, you know, the, the thing isn't the skeleton. The thing is the whole body of people that come together. But what makes the body possible is the skeleton. We could not conceivably have constructed that uh, demonstration. Half the coaches wouldn't have come if they hadn't been paid for by unions paying for them. Sim simple as that. In, in Cardiff, six coaches, three of them uh, raised by the People's Assembly, three of them paid for um, by, the, by the trade unions. It hugely influences our reach that uh, some uh, charity like War on One and John Hillary's campaign against TTIP was part of the, uh, of the, People's, uh, of the People's Assembly. That's what gives it its reach. And because it has that reach, it gets beyond the constituents that made it up in the first place to many hundreds of thousands who like who are people like you for the first time are coming into the in, into the movement. And I but I'd say this about it. For me, one purpose of the movement is for people who come to it towards it like you did, is to say to people once they're in it, you know, it's not just being part of us, you should be part of a union. Let's let's together rebuild the unions in this country because you can see what they've done for us 
and we can rebuild the unions in this country. And by the way, it still matters whether you're in a union. If you're in a union in this country, your wages are automatically 10% higher. If you're a woman in a union in this country, your wages are automatically 30% higher than if you're not in a trade union. So one of the things that we need to do within the anti-austerity movement is use it to rebuild uh, the unions because those things are absolutely central for working uh, working class people. Um, what people made points about, and by the way, with the Labour Party, this isn't unique to the Labour Party. I mean, if you think this is bad, think about 1931 when they, the, the Labour leadership split the party and joined a Tory coalition government. That was a bad moment. You know, the point is that Labour can go through a series of disasters, and it's important to note when the disasters happen and the effects, but it rebuilds itself unless it's replaced. Bad things never disappear. Bad, bad things never simply implode. They have to be replaced, consciously replaced, by something better. You know, PASOK in Greece didn't just hollow out and collapse. It was replaced by Syriza. It was replaced by something better. And that's the project that we're involved in. It can emerge out of the anti-austerity movement, but it won't be the anti-austerity movement. It can be a consequence of it, just in, the, in a minor way. Respect was a reasonably successful thing for a while that emerged out of the Stop the War movement. Other political challenges and other forms of action will emerge. We're at square one now. But you can't get to square 59 by imagining that square one is square 59. You have to go through the other 58 squares in order to get there. And we're at the beginning of this. Manchester will be a different question. The demonstration outside Manchester will be four days of different forms of action. I think it will look much more challenging uh, to them than the demonstration. Look, not that I'm against the demonstration. That's the beginning of this kind of thing. And it'll always be part of the, of, of the movement. But you, you have to create... You have to assemble an army before you go into battle. We're assembling the army. So I've got two more hands. I really want people to think about, um, you know, what's been said here. I mean, there's a lot of brains in this room, and I can feel the heat. So I don't believe for a minute you haven't got questions or contributions, even even if it's about anything from is there a blueprint for a revolution to, you know, all about the movements. Um, so I've got the two, the lady at the back, and then the guy to the right. And more hands, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask what, the, I mean, you've been talking about creating a skeleton and approaching existing networks. You've talked about the union movement. And I wanted to know what you're doing about um, contacting faith groups. Um, Martinez this morning talked about morality and values. Uh, my priest can't talk about the Tory party without saying the word fuck. Um, and has been consistently preaching against the Tories for the last five years. Um, coming from Brighton, it's a bit like coming out when you say that you're a Christian. Kind of in reverse. It's very, very unfashionable. Um, but there is a network there, and there's a lot of passion, and there's a lot of pain actually, for what's going on in this country. And I really, I really would like to see us reaching out to all the faith groups. We have, I think, 71% of this country identifies as belonging to being Christian. And then I think the rest of 14% uh, more identify with a faith, of which I think the Muslim community forms about 2.5%. And we talk a lot about the Muslim community, and I do think we need, I know it's very unfashionable to talk about it from the left, we tend to see religion as a bit of a panacea, and I don't believe that for a minute. I do believe in liberation theology, and I actually really think there is a movement that we can use across this country that's very well established, very strong communities, very, very strong moral values who feel very angry, very upset, and would personally like to see their representatives higher up in the hierarchy, certainly in the Church of England, creating a heck of a lot more noise and supporting um, the grassroots members of all the churches and faiths in this country. I'd like to hear what you're doing about that. Go to the right, I think Dylan T-shirt, I think. Yeah, um, I agree with the sort of characterisation of the, the Labour Party that was sort of outlined. I mean, I would say that, 
you know, obviously workers, um, particularly trade unionists, looking to the Labour Party has, has held back the struggle in this period against austerity as, as well as self-reflected people's desire for reform. I mean, if you look at um, 2011, when the pension strikes were called off, I think a lot of trade union leaders thought, you know, we'll keep our heads down, wait for Labour, and then, okay, things will improve, and obviously that didn't turn, turn out that well. I think the other thing is as well that if you, I don't think society has moved to the right substantially, but I think there's two issues where among work, working class people there's been a bit of a shift. One is immigration and the other one is benefits, unemployment benefits. <coughs> These happen to be the two subjects in which Labour have totally agreed with the Tories on, and I think that has a real sort of impact on the left. So one of my questions is, when we're talking about eventually we want to replace the Labour Party, do we need to start now constructing an alternative so that eventually, you know, we can uh, begin to win more and more people away from the Labour Party to the left? Uh, my other question is just, um, in terms of, um, you know, shutting down the country, I think that's what we'll need to do to defeat, defeat austerity. I think, you know, the massive demonstration is a great start, but obviously we're going to have to do much, much more to defeat the government. I think I'd love to sort of workers in terms of their power to do that. You know, if the bus, if the bus drivers and the tube workers weren't striking in London, that would shut down the city. So my question is, how do we increase um, the amount of strikes and the militancy of strikes and things like that? Thanks. imagine Manchester, the four days of the Tory party conference, if we get enough people in enough places, and I know it's not on the scale of shutting down the country, we could be talking about shutting down the city. It would be fairly simple operation with enough numbers to shut down the tram system, certainly the bus, the buses, maybe Piccadilly Station, Victoria Station, you know, we're talking of having a real impact and kind of making a model, if you like, about, about what could be done. And I want to just give a quick example. When the National Secretary of the People's Assembly, Sam Fairburn, came to speak at my union branch meeting, there was just over 100 people there. And he opened them, it was an AGM, you know, one of the most boring, you know, meetings of the year that you have. So Sam came and spoke about the People's Assembly, um, and, and people were really fired up and voted through 400 pounds to the People's Assembly, and, and everyone was unanimous, and he left. And the next item on the agenda was, should we take industrial action over the redeployment policy? And I know the union were quite nervous about that because at Manchester University, we have a fairly generous redeployment policy, which was under attack, but relative to other universities, it would be quite hard to get solidarity action. So they were thinking the members might not be up for it. Absolutely unanimous in favor of strike action. So there's a small example about how when you, you see, I think there's a bit of an artificial construct between Union members who were sold out a few years ago kind of went back into some kind of hibernation and we've got to get them out again. They are out with us, they're out on the streets, not in organised form, but they're out, we are all out on the streets with the People's Assembly and we're open to the, you know, the influence and the uprising and the massive feeling of confidence that, that you get through being involved in those things. Just on religion, remember in the Stop the War Coalition, Obviously, the um, Muslim community and the Methodists particularly were really important in building the Stop the War Coalition with us and providing venues. And actually, for the Tory party conference, Manchester Cathedral are offering the People's Assembly the cathedral for a third of the price that they would normally hire it out at. Now, you know, they're still charging for it. They're going to do it at cost, if you like. But, you know, that we, we do want to work with all these people and we are reaching out, but it's not them, if you like. They're already within the... Assembly, they're already side by side with us, and we, I think we have to stop thinking about that perhaps the People's Assembly is some kind of bubble that, you know, other people aren't in. It, it's got past that point now, it's, it's, it's much, much bigger. And very last of all, if I've got time, I did have the unfortunate experience of going to Will Straw's post-election so-called Labour Party social. And it was like walking into a funeral wake. It was just absolutely dire. People were so miserable. And I felt on another planet because I'd seen the Facebook stuff happening, the person who talked about the internet, and all the demonstrations that were taking off just after the election. And in Manchester, we could see the Facebook page going for the protest, going up to 3,000 and more. I think it got to 5,000 in the end. 
and when I was talking in that evening to those very miserable Labour Party members, they were all taking the leaflets for the demo. Will Stroddy's picture taken said, I'm going on the demo. And it, it really did kind of lift the mood of that. I don't know what happens now, but I'm just trying to say the influence is perhaps much greater than, than we realise. <laughs> Shelley, can you your hand up? Shelley, apparently, yeah, so Shelley just here, I couldn't see you. It's improbable, but not impossible, for Jeremy Corbyn to win the Labour leadership. And if he does, how does that change your view on the purpose and potential of the Labour left, if at all? And next person is this lady just here, to my left. Thanks for running. If we are to build a mass movement, we need to be more self-aware. And you talk of UKIP as majorly made of Tory voters. That's definitely not the case where I live. The UKIP voters are the people, they're, um, and it's growing in popularity. It's the low period, it's workers, it's people who feel that. This is a strong message and they hear what Farage is saying to them and it means something to them and they are us. And um, the people who would have traditionally voted Labour, we need to acknowledge that if we're going to win people back and to make the movement large enough and universal enough to be successful. And also we need to be aware of the tactics of the opposition because we're always falling into traps set by the trolleys that just leave us all in a mess. We were talking about Nicola Sturgeon and she wiped the floor with them, all the opposition. And maybe she did, I don't know, I didn't watch it, I, I don't have telly, but I saw clips of it on the internet and what I saw was the left arguing amongst themselves. And David Cameron probably sat at home being ready to smug because yes again we've fallen for it and he sat there warning and we we're all just arguing again. So I think, yeah, we need to be more aware of those things and then we can everything and we will together. Uh, back over the room for Lindsay, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to, to make a couple of points, but just in terms of that last point about UKIP, I mean, I think it's absolutely true that a lot of people who traditionally voted Labour and who won't vote Tory, uh, particularly, I think, in places like some of the uh, the northern towns in Yorkshire and in some of the South Wales places and I did a meeting in Merthyr where UKIP came second and got 6,000 votes. Now this is one of the strongest traditionally Labour areas which is where Keir Hardin was the MP. It was a strong mining area and it, it speaks to the to what's happened to people particularly in lots of those those areas that they haven't got the employment, their kids haven't got the employment conditions where you do have jobs have got much, much worse and, and it's easy in those circumstances that some of those people do blame it on immigrants even though that clearly isn't the reason uh, the reason why it's happened. But So I think we need to recognise that but I think we also should recognise that the only way you can combat this is by saying this is the wrong diagnosis of what's gone wrong and it's blaming the wrong people for what has happened and I think it's very, very important that we do uh, uh, we do do that, but I also think it's a product of Labour's erosion over decades now. And we talk about why they lost the last election. Actually, one reason they lost is a third of people who could vote didn't go out and vote, and they're nearly all Labour, you know, traditionally Labour voters in those sorts of areas. I know in the areas around here, the turnout is relatively low. Very, very strong Labour, but lots and lots of people don't bother to vote, aren't lots of them aren't on the register. So I think this is a big question of how Labour has eroded and has become much weaker. The problem with building an alternative is that I do think this isn't a question of we have to start somewhere and let's get an absolutely crap vote and think that that's going to improve things, because I don't think it will. And I think the only way you can really build an electoral alternative is to look at how people have done it in the past. Look at Scotland. They did it through the radical independence movement through those sorts of things, through a left alternative thing. If you look at Labour itself, 
Labour was built out of actually defeated strikes of the 1890s and the successful strikes of the 1880s. And we have to build a movement to be able to build any kind of political alternative. I think not to do that is really kind of putting the cart before the horse. You know, people can say, let's put our flag up and haven't we got a great policy? Well, it may be, but when you get 0.5% of the vote, you've got to ask yourself, who are you talking to, really? And the answer is not many people. And it's still right at the back. I think Lindsay's right. I think we do need to talk about and learn from the lessons the way people have done this elsewhere. And one of the key places we need to look is a place that's within our country. Like Lindsay says, we need to learn from Scotland. Now, Scotland is obviously very close to us. It's somewhere we can easily talk to and we need to learn from it. Um, you know, the campaign, the referendum campaign, was a long campaign. In England, we only started paying attention to it quite late in the day. In the other day. But it's been going on ever since the SNP got their majority government, people knew it was coming. And if people remember back or if people looked at it, the campaign fought by the SNP was really very conservative. It was, it was a campaign that stressed what wasn't going to change with independence. We'll still have the Queen, we'll still have the Pound, we'll still be in the EU, we'll still be in NATO, we'll have our own nice flag. And it, 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 was, it, was, it was a campaign that was about continuity rather than about change. By the end of the campaign, you could see that this has radically changed. And this changed for a reason, like Lindsay said, it was because that there was an intervention into the campaign to change it by the Radical Independence Conference, which took the pool of anger that exists across British society and funneled it. It funneled it and channeled it and directed it and turned it into something that could actually start to have change because it brought together people from lots of different political backgrounds, not just people who supported the assembly, but people who supported Labour or the Greens or other parties. It brought everybody together that opposes austerity and wants a different kind of society. And that was a, that was big, only happened because a group of socialists in Scotland decided that this needed to happen, that we needed to bring these together. Now in England, we're, we're, we're kind of behind them. But on the other hand, I think with the demonstration last week, we've really started to create a similar kind of funnel in England in the People's Assembly. Something that can bring together all the strength of civil society and, social, and the social movements and all the people who oppose austerity together. Now, turning this into a political vehicle is more difficult. In Scotland, the SNP has been around for 50 years, 60 years, and it's quite flexible. It's not tied to the ruling class where Tories are. It's not tied to the British state where Labour is. It was able to re-entorientate quite quickly and take advantage of this. This gave it a pretty cool expression in Scotland. That's also in a way a disadvantage because some of that ground is occupied already by a political party. In England, it's going to be more difficult for us because of our electoral system, because of the strength of Labour. But on the other hand, you know, we have a, we have a clearer ground. We all have, need to get onto it, but we need to get the order of events in the right order. We need to build the movement. Once we build the movement, political questions will arise of them themselves. And the last person is this woman just here. And apologies to everybody, I couldn't fit in just not enough time. But tomorrow is another day, so you, you'll have a chance tomorrow and the next session. Hi, yeah, um, a lot of people have been talking about Scotland and uh, people mentioned industrial action. Last weekend we were up in the rally in George Square in Glasgow and the mood amongst union leaders and the general public was very much in favour of a general strike and I know they want to link up with the colleagues across the UK and there's an awful lot of support for all that industrial action and I just wanted to feed that back. Yeah, um, first of all, on the question of faith groups, uh, I agree with the point. I don't think we've done enough now uh, about it, but I think it's definitely something that we should. I think it, it, I think actually it would be great if at one point during uh, the Manchester thing, we have a huge rally in the cathedral. I think that's kind of the best propaganda over this point that you could possibly, possibly make. Um, I think if you think back to the early uh, mobilizations uh, of the anti-capitalist movement, um, and one of the biggest, was the Make Poverty History demonstration in, um, in Edinburgh. Um, and indeed, before that, a big demonstration um, in uh, Birmingham. Both of those had uh, massive NGO and church uh, mobilizations. And I think that uh, you won't go to many food banks in this country and not find uh, people from the churches working in them. And I think that's both the food banks and the churches, I think, are um, resources for the movement, people who will want to be involved, but we haven't sufficiently um, done that uh, uh, done that for yet. Um, on the question of um, of, of UKIP, um, 
I'm sure if, if you're in a working class constituency, of course, most of the votes came from the working class. If you look at the figures overall, the total vote nationally, that's not where most uh, UKIP votes came from. But of course, that doesn't help you if you're in a working class constituency. You have to deal with that. And the way of dealing with that is to say, OK, I think the things that motivate people to vote UKIP uh, in working class constituencies are less the question of immigration or only the question of immigration uh, to the extent that there's displacement for lack of jobs, lack of opportunity, uh, cuts in the welfare system and they hear Labour saying the same things as the Tories on these issues and therefore they become very disillusioned and tend to vote for UKIP. The answer to that is to provide a better response over the cuts, over austerity, over jobs, uh, than anybody else does, and that's partly what this movement's for, is to say to people, there is a better way of dealing with this than to vote for, well, I mean, I mean imagine, Nigel Farage is a publicly school educated um, city analyst. I mean, nobody really believes that that kind of person is going to provide a solution for working class uh, people uh, who he most frequently meets as servants. Um, I don't think that's a, a credible point of, uh, point of view, really. So I think our job is to provide a better and more robust answer uh, to those working class people um, than UKIP could possibly, uh, could, uh, possibly do. And of course, part, part of the point of UKIP is to turn one working class person against another. So you may do exactly the same job. You may be working for exactly the same low wages. You may be working exactly the same poor hours, but just because you come from some other bit of the globe, we'll turn on you and give you a good kicking instead of the bankers and the Tories. And that's the argument that we have to undermine in the, in the anti-austerity movement, I think. Um, on the question of the strikes, um, we, we have to judge where we are. Um, of course, if we can get strike action, it's always the most effective uh, form of activity that working people uh, can possibly have. And that's why the Tories are out to introduce legislation that will make it even harder than it is already for working people to exercise the fundamental right, fundamental civil liberty of withdrawing your labour. That is a fundamental human, human right and the Tories are out to limit it. Of course, we know that if the, the same conditions were imposed on Tory MPs, as they are suggesting are imposed on the unions in terms of the electoral turnout. There would only be 57 of them in the, in the House of Commons um, now. So we've got a moral right on our side, and we've also got the most effective action. But in terms of strike action, it's a historic low in this country. That's sim I don't like it. I wish it were different. It's simply the truth. We aim, through building a mass anti-austerity movement, to help to reinvigorate and to re-impart to the union movement a combativity and an ability to take strike action that it doesn't have. So on Budget Day, when we have our protest in uh, Parliament Square, we're going to have it under the, under the slogan, Strike and Protest, and we're going to invite down to that every group of strikers, there aren't many, but we're going to invite down every group of strikers, the Barnet Unison strikers, the uh, National Gallery strikers, to come down and speak on that protest because we want to amplify um, uh, that message and to impart through that um, the centrality of unions being able, to take, uh, being able to take strike action. I would love it uh, for it to be the case that um, some of the discussions that we're having with some of the rail unions, I would love it to be the case that on the first day of Tory party conference, we close down Manchester Piccadilly uh, station. But to do that will require political act by the trade unions, and that's got to be something that they feel they will have overwhelming public support for if they're, if they're willing to do it. And that's the kind of dynamic that we, one of the dynamics that we need to get going to, to reinforce the strength, of the strength of the movement. I think, um, I think, as Shelley says, it's, it's unlikely that, that Jeremy uh, w would win, uh, partly because it's a, you know, it's a transferable vote system. So when Liz Kendall is knocked out first, um, her votes will go to the next most right-wing person. And then, uh, so that's unlikely. Um, but uh, I wish it weren't. I, I hope. I, I would hope that Jeremy would win. I think the most likely outcome would be that the Labour Party would split. I think the Blairites would not stomach that for a single second. I think they would do um, what the um, SDP did in the early 80s when they were faced 
uh, with the challenge uh, from Tony Benn and his supporters inside the Labour Party, and they would leave the Labour Party rather than have it um, uh, run by the left uh, by the left wing. In which case, I think we would have arrived at a point which we might arrive at by other means, but if it arrived this way, that would be fine with me. We would have have a left of centre party. Uh, in this country which would be functioning rather like Syriza, would have to rebuild itself as a party by involving people from the social movements. I would be in favour of that. It would mean that there was a, a genuine left of centre organisation reflecting what most working people think in this country. And if you look at the opinion polls, they haven't moved. They haven't moved. Um, as one time you say, it's true they haven't moved on the question of immigration, but on absolutely key questions like nationalisation, by public ownership of the health service, by public provision of education, by public provision of higher education. M the mass of working class people in this country haven't moved since the days of the welfare state consensus in the 70s and the 80s. And if a party arose which actually represented them, instead of getting them to vote for a right of centre neoliberal agenda, which is what the current Labour Party does, and that's why there's a tension in it, uh, that would be an advance in my, in my, in my, in my estimation. Wouldn't be the end of the problem. <coughs> wouldn't do the end of the problem, wouldn't solve the problem of whether or not you can get a socialist transformation of society through Parliament. The series of crisis shows you exactly what the depth of that problem looks like. It shows you that a left of centre party, even when it has mass electoral support, can't win without extra parliamentary mobilisation. That the question of seizing the government isn't the question, same question as seizing power that the success of Syriza will depend on popular mobilisation outside Parliament, by the unions, by the social movements. It doesn't resolve that question. And it ultimately cannot, it can be a step on the road towards, but will not be in the end of the day, a quest, uh, resolve the question of whether or not you can get socialism by uh, parliamentary means, or whether or not you need to dispossess the people who control the, facts, the factories, the banks, the corporations, uh, the civil service, the army, the police, whether or not there needs to be a mass movement, i.e. a revolutionary transformation of society. I want, my vision of a revolutionary organisation is one that travels that path with every group of working people who is trying to move forward. A demonstration I know won't be enough. Strikes and a demonstration, by the way, wouldn't be enough. Strikes and demonstrations and direct action won't be enough. But on every step of the way, I want to be in the forefront of what is possible today in order that what we build today will be a platform for greater action tomorrow. I might not agree with the whole strategy of Jeremy Corbyn, but I know that if he gets a good vote, if he gets a brilliant vote, that's a step forward for all of us. So without necessarily sharing the Labour Party's whole perspective, I want to travel that road with them. And I think the job of revolutionaries is to be in solidarity with every progressive step forward that any group of working people make, whether they're in my party or in some other party or in no party. And as we do that together, we will increase the possibility, increase the consciousness, the combativity of working people so that they get to the point where they realise that once and for all, we are going to have to have a society which is based on the democratic will of the people who produce the wealth, who produce the entire, uh, the entire um, society's capacity to feed and clothe and house itself and to take that into our own hands. Thank you to John and thank you for all your contributions. Just quickly, some